I'll make a start. Uh, hello, my name is Judith and I'm from Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. I have recently completed a master's degree, making me an officially qualified creative technologist, which is pretty cool. Uh, I still work at AUT and I do some work for Prezi as well. I made an iPad app as part of my master's degree and a lot of this talk was inspired by the challenges and pitfalls that I faced when I set out to create an app that enabled real-time collaboration uh, between nearby devices. So some of the things you heard Tim talking about being frustrated about, those, those are the similar things that I encountered as well. Making computers talk is one of the most fundamental parts of computer science, of computer programming, and networking is at the heart of a lot of apps you use and experience every day. It enables a whole wealth of possible rich user experiences, and that really unlocks the potential of the devices. They don't just sit in isolation. Many applications use the internet for communication. However, sometimes we just want to deal with local data that between a certain set of devices that are nearby. And you might have previously heard of this referred to as nearby networking. So that's mostly what we're interested in today, not how to network with everyone everywhere, because uh, networking is a huge talk, and an hour isn't nearly enough time to cover that. People do entire degrees about it. Why, why are we interested in devices that are nearby? This concept of peer-to-peer -peer networking is not new. As we know in computing, it can be a way for computers to share resources amongst each other without a centralized administrative system. This is the concept that things such as BitTorrenting is built on. Uh, not that anyone here is familiar with that. And even though the internet is enabling us to communicate with people all over the world, where there are situations where we are just interested in a group of people in the same location, for example. We're all in the same location now. Or a classroom is another very good example, and that's part of my area of interest and research as well. When you have users and devices in a relatively close proximity, you can actually utilize hardware features such as Bluetooth, infrastructure Wi-Fi, if you have people on the same Wi-Fi network, and ad hoc Wi-Fi. If you've ever used AirDrop, this is the concept that is built on. Without having to talk to a server, you can transfer large files between devices, even if you have no internet connection. I've done this on an airplane before, even though you're supposed to switch off Wi-Fi capability. Um, even though it's important, to, though it is important to note that iOS has been able to do this, has been able to communicate with devices from the start. In iOS 2.0, first introduced NSNet service, which is your best friend, and we'll be looking at that later. This is the underlying concept we'll be looking at today. How do we connect with peers who are physically nearby in the space? You might have heard of FireChat before, and this is an app that utilizes Apple's framework for peer-to-peer -peer networking, which is multi-peer connectivity, to create anonymous chat rooms to connect with people nearby who are also using the app. And that's gained a lot of interest. So over the next 45 minutes or so that I have you, I'll take you through different ways of getting this capability into your app. I will look at, so the super easy one is what uh, Tim was talking about as well, with where it gives you, it gives you boilerplate user interface, uh, view controller that you can use for connecting, and then through to actually throwing that away and looking at how do you handle that yourself programmatically with or without, with custom UI or without UI altogether. Um, I'll talk a bit about the custom discovery options, but I'll touch very, br only very br briefly on that because what we're more interested in is when you do hit these limitations of multi-peer connectivity, how do you throw that out the window and roll your own custom framework? I'll take you through several worked examples in code, uh, which I will have available at some point online. Um, you can email me for the draft version of the code. It still needs to be tidied up, and I'm happy to give that to you. First, let's look at how to actually get two things to talk to each other. Put very simply, the communication can be split into two parts. First, you need to facilitate a connection. That is actually getting A and B to see each other. And you need to ensure, uh, and start a communication channel, usually using a socket. Once you start to throw data between A and B, you need to ensure that B knows how to understand what A is saying and vice versa. They need to know how to interpret this data. This is where we'll look at protocols and their importance in network programming. With abstracted frameworks, such as multi-peer connectivity, you don't have to worry too much about the transfer protocol from the stream or any of the other too deep networking stuff. This is taking care of you under the, taking care of for you under the hood. 
So in most cases, archiving in NS Dictionary and unarchiv unarchiving it on the other end just works, works great. However, in our more custom example, you'll see that if you, want to be, you, if you want to be writing to your sockets directly, you'll need to be able to manage that flow of data. This can be as simple as putting an integer-sized integer header with the length of your data packet before the packet itself. So each example we look at will be broken down into these two phases. So using multi-peer connectivity after the, out of the box, this is super easy. Networking in general isn't easy, and anyone who tries to tell you otherwise is either lying or trying to sell you something. But in iOS 7, Apple introduced a new framework for, for iOS. And then in 8.0 and OS 10 Yosemite, they brought it out so you could do it between iOS and Mac. The multi-peer connectivity is in, framework is, in short, a great piece of work. It is an abstraction layer that offers the easy-to-use APIs and for networking capability, including discovering and connecting to peers and exchanging data over infrastructure, Wi-Fi, ad hoc Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth, as I mentioned. And it even handles certificate, certificates and security for you. I can never say that. It allows people with essentially zero networking, network, lower level networking knowledge to write a network tap, which was me a year ago. And that's why I really wanted to build something with this. The huge gain is that it is really smart. As Tim was mentioning just before he ran off, if you have a device on Wi-Fi and a device on Bluetooth and a device on both, the other two can communicate to each other through the one in the middle. And this is all handled for you. So you don't get to specify what interface you're using, which can also be a bit of a gotcha. But again, because we are not relying on a connection to a server, we can actually use it without an internet connection. You can actually create a wireless network without an internet connection, and it will work over that. But you don't really understand too much of what's going on under the hood when you implement multi-peer connectivity in its simplest form. You only need a few things to set up. First, we need to facilitate the connection, which in multi-peer connectivity is known as the discovery phase. And multi-peer connectivity works on the concept of browsing and advertising, where a browser is a device that is searching for nearby devices, and an advertiser is a device that is discoverable by other devices. I had to draw this diagram when I was working with it because I kept forgetting which way around it was. The initialization for both is very similar. They both have a peer ID, which is initialized with a display name. In this case, we're just grabbing the name of the device, UI device, current device name. And then this peer ID is used to initialize the session object, which we then set, and then we set ourselves up as a delegate. These session objects are used to instantiate the browser view controller and the advertiser assistant objects. Both of these also need a service type, and this is important because devices will only discover services of the same type. So you actually won't see any other devices if they have a different service type. The advertiser is the only one that has a different, it has an additional parameter, which is the discovery info, and that's more information, that's a dictionary, and you can hand over more information about yourself when you're being discovered. A device can both browse and advertise at the same time. So it's just a matter of studying the advertiser and setting ourselves up as a delegate and then presenting the browser view controller. Relatively straightforward. Again, it's much, if you were in a previous session, you would have seen that. Uh, session phase is how we interpret the information. And yeah, so multi peer connectivity, that's called the session phase. Once our two devices are in session together, we can send data. We can encode a string as NS data and send that out to, to all the peers that we're in a session with. Multi-peer connectivity hand, will nicely hand you all your connected peers in an array. So session, my session, connected peers. And these are the different types of data you can send. You can send data, byte stream, or resource. The delegate knows that it's data coming in. So on the other side, we can just use a did receive data method and we know it's a string we've sent through on one side, and so we can just decode that on the other side. Pretty simple. Let's have a look at a demo, which I'm going to touch on very briefly, and I hope that the demo gods will be kinder to me. So again, this will look very familiar. I've got my, I've imported the framework, I've set up as a delegate of browser view controller. All I'm creating here is a very simple chat app. I think it's gonna be the next biggest thing though because no one's made chat app before, right? And I'm going to call it WinChat. And 
All this is is a view controller file, and I've imported everything here. And Tim mentioned this as well, and I think this was something he stole from me from a couple of years ago. Um, where remember to import the framework. You do laugh, but you do forget, and you spend uh, Xcode is actually pretty good at reminding you now if you've forgotten to import a framework, but it, it gets even the most seasoned developers. Uh, I've got a few properties I'm using. I've got my browser view controller, my advertiser assistant, and my session object and my peer ID. And then just some simple, I've got my button and some things for sending the chat. Oh, where are we? And then just in my view controller.m, all I'm doing is I'm setting up the multi peer, which is creating my peer ID, setting up my session and my browser view controller and advertiser. Um, and then all I have to do to browse is I just present the browser view controller and that handles everything for me there. We get notified when, when someone dismisses those, the view controller and we, when, we connect, when we get a connection to a peer, we can check whether we're connected to them, whether we're in the process of connecting to them or when they disconnect. Here's our... Here's where we receive our data, and again, that's just what we saw before. We're getting a message, and we're decoding it, and we're, pr we're putting it in our box, in a chat box, so we can see what the other person has sent. And that's mostly what we need to know here. And so let's actually have a look at that working. So I'm going to run that on simulator, and I'm going to run that on device. So I can start browsing here. So I haven't done a lot of customization at this point. So I've got the default eight people in session. There we go. So there's my device. I can connect to zero. And I get the notification on my device asking if I want to connect. I can say yes. I haven't had to write any code for that. It prompts me automatically. And now if I go done, I can say hello. And it prints it out. And I can say Good morning, back from my iPad, and that comes through. So that's super easy, and it'll be in the App Store this afternoon. So next, what we want to do, um, yes, and we'll have the VCs on the line any minute. Let's see if my, this is working. OK, I think this is working now. All right, so that was great. That was really, really easy. You can get some sample code and have it up and running very quickly. Even if you don't want to wait for mine, you can Google, and there's lots of great tutorials about that. It is common to see multi-peer connectivity implemented in this, very, in this simplest form with the inbuilt UI. And, but what if we want to customize it a bit more? If you want to build a more seamless and customized experience, you'll be wanting to be rolling with the punches with, under the hood to handle peer discovery and the connection yourself. This lets you create your custom UI, or you can throw the UI out altogether and just have peers connecting automatically to each other. When we start to get to this level of customization, you'll see in the next demo we start using protocols. This isn't necessary for multi-peer connectivity, but protocols are a fundamental part of network programming, and so we're going to take a moment to look at that. Put simply, put really simply, a protocol is a system of rules or conventions for communication. Protocols are used by pilots, by surgeons, by emergency services, by law enforcement to make sure that important messages are communicated and understood correctly. Network protocols you may have heard of are things such as TCP and UDP. In programming, you may not be writing both sides of the network code, so it is important to adhere to a protocol. They can be as simple or as complex as you need them to be, and in the next iteration of my app, I'm going to be adding some new features for version 2.0. Maybe later. Um, and so I'm going to create a pro simple protocol that will help me when I'm connecting to new peers. In real life, when you meet someone, go over to them, walk over to them. What's the first thing you say? Hello? Hello, my name is? My name is Judith. And then you get a good look at my face and see what I look like. And then so it's been a very simple communication right there. And then I'll then the other person probably says, hello, my name is so on and so forth back. So we're going to implement what we're going to call a hello protocol in our app. When I discover a new peer and connect to it, I'm going to say hello to them. I want to send them some more information, such as my real name and my avatar. 
every device will have to adhere to this protocol. So when I join a session, I'm going to say hello to everyone in the session. And if someone new joins the session, I have to say hello to that one person. And the same way, everyone has to say hello to me when I join. That way, everyone knows who everyone is. And in your app, it will also mean that everyone in communicating in your app will know who everyone is in the session. The hello protocol is very simple. It's mostly just going to be sending data. I've got my dictionary. And I've defined a message type at the beginning. And I'll explain that in a minute. I'm putting in my multi-peer connectivity peer ID so they can reference that back to that peer ID object. And I'm going to put in my real name and my display avatar. In this app, I'm just using a bunch of random Im images of different cute animals, which you'll see. And I can just archive that as data and then use my send data method to send it to all my peers. Then, on the other side, we can interpret that. Which and we know from the message type we've defined that's a hello, so we know what values to pull out of our dictionary. This is one example of the type of information that my peers are going to be sending to each other. And so I'm going to have three different types of data that I want to send across. I can define these three different protocols using simple integers and include these in every dictionary. So when I'm interpreting the data, I can very quickly determine what kind of message I'm dealing with, whether it's a hello, a text, or an image. And which is why I defined in that dictionary that said hello, and I know what to pull out on the other end. So back to multi-peer connectivity. It's not too different from the last example, so let's have a look at facilitating the connection. For the discovery phase, it's pretty much the same. I set up my peer ID, initialize it with my name, and I set up my session with that peer ID. For advertising and browsing, this time we're using the nearby service advertiser and the nearby service browser. But these are initialized in much the same way as the browser view controller and the advertiser assistant that we saw in the last example. We set ourselves up as a delegate, and then we can start browsing for peers, and we can start advertising. When we discover a peer, this time we have to handle it all ourselves. The delegate notifies us that we've found a new peer, and we want to automatically connect to them. Obviously, you should do some kind of check to make sure that you want to invite this person. You'll have to handle a check yourself to make sure that you actually have room in your session. Uh, if you've hit the limit of you plus seven people, then it will fail. Um, you're handed the discovery info by the delegate as well, which you can use to check if maybe you want everyone to say, I'm interested in talking to people who like cats or who like sheep. And you can, everyone puts in a discovery info, and then you can only connect to other people who are interested in cats or something like that. We've left this nil for now because we're just going to invite everyone who we find. The gotcha here is that because both devices will be simultaneously browsing and advertising at the same time, you have to, you have to make a decision about who will actually invite who. You can't have each other advertising, uh, inviting each other. So the simple solution to this is we need some kind of conflict resolution, and it has to be the same outcome on both sides. So they're in agreement about who is inviting and who is waiting for an invitation. All we're doing here is we're comparing the, PI, the peer IDs, the string value of the peer IDs, and whoever has the higher one sends the invitation, and then the other one sits and twiddles their thumbs waiting for the invitation. The person being invited will get the delegate method with the invitation, and we're just automatically going to accept it here, because we want to connect to anyone that comes along. The session phase is very similar to what we saw last time as well. The underlying process is more or less exactly the same, but because we have different types of data we're sending, we want to put our protocols in place. To send our data, we're putting our dictionary in, we're putting our information in a dictionary and archiving that, and again, just sending it to all our peers. And we can, on the other side, we can receive the data. And again, we've got that message type in the dictionary. So this time, we know that the incoming message type is text. So on the other end, we can determine it's text. So it's an NS string we're pulling out of this dictionary. It might seem like a bit more work, but when you have several types of information you want to send between peers, protocols are your friend. So let's have a look at a demo. And I'm going to sit down so I can see my screen. So now I've got the next iteration of my app, which I'm going to call Water Chat. So I've got a bit more going on here this time. 
And so we'll start why, by just, let's have a look at the storyboard. And this time it's a tabbed application. I'll have a table view to show me all my peers, all my nearby peers. I'll have a chat functionality, same as last time. And I'll be able to send images to my peers as well. In my constants file, this is where I've defined those protocols for my different message types that I've mentioned. And in our peer manager, you can see that we're importing multi-peer connectivity frameworks, same as last time. We're, we're at it, making ourselves delegate of the nearby service browser, near, nearby service advertiser, so we can get those notifications, those delegate methods. And everything else looks more or less similar. We have to handle our peers ourselves. Oh, we don't have to. It can still hand you the, your connected peers, but because I'm, I'm setting up an array so I can keep track of them myself as well. As I'm, for each peer, I'm going to create my own implementation of a peer object. So I've got a peer remote peer. I'm using a singleton, similar to what a singleton, a singleton class, same as what Tim did. It's not lazy programming. It's actually a very good design method. I love using singletons. And all we're doing here is we're starting, our, we're starting advertising for peers. We're setting up our session the same way we saw last time. And we're starting advertising for peers. And we're starting browsing for peers. Uh, we've got our service type. Um, with the, with the delegate for the advertiser and browser. And again, once we find a peer, um, we can get more information about them. We add them to our peer array. We can do our logic about, whether, about who's doing the inviting. Um, we're doing a check to make sure that our session isn't full. And otherwise, we just wait for the invitation. And then once we've gotten a notification, it's further down here somewhere, we get notified if we've lost a peer, so we can get rid of them. And here we get the notifications from a delegate about whether we're connecting to a peer, whether we've lost a peer. And so this is where we're implementing our hello protocol, that if we're connected to a new peer, we have to say hello to them. And that's where we're sending all that across. Once, and I've got my invitation handler here as well, somewhere. And when I get an invitation, protocols, invitation. Lost peer. There we are. There's, so we are. So if I get an invitation, I just get did receive an invitation from peer, tells me the peer, and we're just accepting it. But again, that's where you get some of the flexibility to say to make that decision. But let's have a look at that and make sure I run the correct one. So we're going to run it on simulator and run it on device. So this, is, this will be the table that will hold all my nearby peers. And I'm waiting for it to launch on my iPad. It's taking a little, there we go. We've launched on iPad and there we are. So that is a truncated UUID I've just created randomly for every peer. So we've found our peer and we're connecting. We haven't said hello yet. Um, there we are. So our iPad has said hello now, and we can see we've got a little avatar for it, and that's there. So now if I go to the chat, I can, as before, I can receive messages from my iPad, and I can send hello back. And now I want to try out my new functionality to send a picture. So I'm going to send a photo from my iPad. Maybe I won't put that in the stream. There anyway, the picture of Melbourne. Just oh, it's actually a screenshot of something. It's fine. So that's on the way over. So I can send a photo back as well. And one thing I love about new Xcode is you actually get some images in your camera roll. It's <laughs> so useful. So I can send that back. And there we go. So my images come across. And you do have a bit of a delay. And I'll talk more about this later. But so I'm on the other side, I'm still waiting, still waiting. So it takes, it's taking at least 10 seconds to send across. And, but we can see in the logs, because it's really helpful, especially in network apps, if you log everything. So I can see that iPhone simulator sent an image. And then on the other side, we haven't received the information about that yet. So perhaps I need to do a bit more work on my app to make this more reliable. But generally, text works great. And I can connect to people. And 
it's really nice to not have to do that extra step for the user to have to accept and decline things. But it'll depend completely on what your app does. But otherwise, that can be just a, that's, that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to customize it a bit more. So our app is looking a bit better now. But what if we want some even more customization? Initially in the app, we saw our nearby peers appear on the table identified by only their display name. And that wasn't very meaningful while we were still connecting. We could have sent the discovery info with the option to um, when we set up our peer ID. And as I mentioned earlier, this is just a dictionary um, that can contain some extra information that your peers can see before you connect. So we could have actually sent our real name before we connected. So we didn't have to do that in the hello protocol. So it's great if you want to send over a name, but because it's a bonjour txt record, you're limited to 255 bytes. This is not enough to send over an avatar image. I've tried, and it took me a while to figure out why it wasn't working. So far with multi peer connectivity, we've looked at both UI-based and programmatic discovery. But you also have the option of the custom discovery, which lets you actually exchange more data before you've connected to each other. So it lets you do it in the discovery phase. This approach gives you full control of the discovery process, but you are responsible for actually implementing and the discovery of who is nearby and for establishing that link. So you do a lot more of the heavy lifting yourself. I don't have enough time to go into this today, but I just want to make you aware that this is an option. Um, for more information, there was a WWDC session this year, and he talks about how to do this custom discovery. This works great. But it's not without this, its limitations, some of which you, we were already seeing in this demo and in Tim's demo. Firstly, you have no control of your interface. You might find yourself using Bluetooth when Wi-Fi is available, which is fine for simple updates in a game, but not so good for transfer of photos, as we saw. We, we were waiting around for that image for quite a while. In that last demo, you saw the delay as well in between when we said hello as w and waiting for that avatar image and the name to come through. Its speed isn't the best, and it's generally inconsistent. Next, it's not cross-platform. So if you have Android users and you want your app to send data to them, you're going to have a bad time. Peers sometimes don't go away. And when they do, they might actually still be there. So you have to do a bit of extra work to make sure you don't send data to dead endpoints, which has happened to me as well. Apple has suggested a fix for this, that you reuse peer IDs. And one way that they suggested to do this is to serialize it and save it in your user default. So you're always using the same peer ID object every time. Um, and finally, as we saw, we have a maximum connection limit of eight. And this is fine if you're making a game. But if in some way, anything like a classroom situation, it's not as useful. It's, it's not, it's not going to work, <laughs> simply put. Some people you talk to have never seen some of these problems. Um, I know if you ask Tim, he hasn't seen some of these problems. And it is a bit more reliable if you use the boilerplate one. And when you start getting into more of the custom implementation, that's where you start to hit these problems. I faced these problems <laughs> over the course of making my app. And I realized very quickly that multi peer connectivity wasn't going to work for me. I, these are known bugs, and the kind and patient engineers at the WWDC Labs told me that fixes are on the way. Uh, Stack Overflow is full of people with these same problems, and there's not a lot of solutions besides workarounds and hacks. So my advice to you is try it out. multi peer connectivity is great for getting an app off the ground and prototyping networking capability. It might work very well for what you want to do. And but you'll get a feel really quickly whether it will be able to stand up to what it is that you want to do if you're trying to do more intense things, such as send lots of images. Make sure you test, test, test as well, because it might work well with two devices, but doesn't scale very well. Might not scale up to seven, up to the full eight. Um, it's also important, important to remember that on older devices, such as iPad 2, uh, that doesn't have the lightning connector, and the ad hoc Wi-Fi only works on the lightning devices, so you're not going to have the ad hoc Wi-Fi option. So it's always, almost always going to prefer Bluetooth. So that's what, what I found when I was testing between an iPad 2 and an iPad Air. It was very slow. As I mentioned, there's been a session on multi-peer connectivity both last year and this year, because uh, it was only introduced last year. So check that out if you want more information. But we're, we're going to move on. We're not done. You might find yourself in my shoes, and multi-peer connectivity really doesn't work for what you'd like to do. So I did what most people do, and I sat down for a few days and designed and coded my own networking framework. 
So maybe not what most sane people would do. And this last section will look at how to strip away the abstractions of multi-peer connectivity and harness the power of the underlying network capabilities of iOS and OS X. In iOS 7, NSNet service, NS service added the ability to use peer-to-peer -peer discovery, and this meant that it, I could turn it on and off at my own leisure. So it gave me the option to use that ad hoc Wi-Fi as well. In addition to this, Bonjour is a time-tested method used for everything from Christmas lights to printers. Because of how it is designed, Bonjour allows us to leverage discovery in a much more powerful way. This led me to dramatically reduce discovery times from two to four seconds down to less than half a second, uh, including resolve, resolving the discovered service. This also meant that when pairs disappeared, they disappeared immediately. By going down this path, we're also able to leverage and control the use of infrastructure Wi-Fi, and using the latest routers, I saw transfer times, insane transfer times. This is the added bonus, the added bonus of this is that it allows us to leverage technologies built into modern access points, such as flow control and Bonjour proxies. For those of you who aren't familiar with Bonjour, it is Apple's implementation of a zero-conf technology. By utilizing Bonjour, it allows us to easily discover services and resolve host names without any messy manual IP entries. By working at this layer, we have to do, we have to have a lot better control of how and when we find peers and swap data so we can do a lot more powerful things. So let's get stuck into it, starting with facilitating the connection. So a lot of the stuff is what multi connectivity is based on, and that's a bit smaller than I was expecting, but what we do, in order to start interacting with Bonjour, we use a class called NSNet Service. To instantiate an instance of this class, we need to provide a domain, an identifier in the form of a type for our service, as well as a unique name for us ourselves so we can be identified. Again, this is very similar to what we've seen in previous implementations. But in, in addition to this, you also need to provide a port to the NSNet service. This is probably, probably the most difficult part. And without diving too deep into the code, there are examples on how to do this, and this code will be available as well. After instantiating the instance of the NSNet service, we set ourselves up as a delegate and publish the service. In addition to this, similar to multi-peer multi connectivity, we provide what is known as a TXT record. This is provided in the form of simple keys and values, and we can use this information to provide more information. Uh, we can use this information once we resolve the service to learn more about it. To browse for these services is just as simple. We use a class called NSNet Service Browser. Oh, supposed to be doing that. Um, we use a service called NSNet Browser. And it's a simple case of initializing, setting ourselves up as a delegate, and then calling search for services of type, providing it with an identifier of our type and the domain we wish to search in. As, noted, as a note here, pay very special attention to the domain you are searching in. As with the introduction of iCloud, you may unexpectedly be finding services which are not on your local network. Again, I speak from experience. So as I mentioned before, in iOS 7, peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer browsing was introduced to NSNet services. In order to activate this, simply call set includes peer-to-peer -peer yes before you start browsing. And it's simple as that. When a service is discovered, you'll get a delegate callback, did find service, and once we find a service, if we want to obtain TXT record info, we simply call resolve with timeout on the service, and then this will provide us with a callback once the service is resolved. At this point, we now know everything about the service, and in this case, the service is a peer. So don't worry too much about this. If, um, the next step is to use the information of the service, such as the host name and port, to create socket streams to read and write the data to the service. Unlike multi-peer connectivity, which gives us the niceties of sending files and whole objects and getting callbacks when we receive this data, we need to handle this manually. When dealing with sockets, protocols are especially important as you need to interpret the bytes coming across and know when you've received the packet that, was, that you want. A simple protocol to do this is to encode a packet as NS data. In this case, our packet is an NS dictionary. We're then going to work out the size of the, pa size of the packet, append this to the outgoing buffer as the size of int, and append our raw packet. 
On the other side, we can simply extract the size of the packet and we know when we've finished receiving the entire packet. I haven't gone into too much detail. The point of this talk is not to teach you about sockets. And don't be scared if all this sounds complicated. I'm not fully sure I understand it all myself. And, but there are hundreds of tutorials out there on how to do all this over the internet, in addition to multiple libraries on GitHub if you need to use them. But what does this actually mean for what we're trying to achieve? Effectively, what we have done is made so that every device advertises itself and allows others to discover and connect to it. In addition to this, each service is also browsing and connecting to devices, to other services. Once we have this, we can basically now have incoming data stream, which we can process on, as well as an outgoing one for each peer. Fun, isn't it? It's important to note that you're dealing with the lowest levels of core foundation, and it's easy to get lost in there. I myself leverage hev heavily from tutorials and examples on the internet. In particular, one that's been duplicated for years and still works. Thank you, Peter Bakirov. And to make these services easy to, easy to work with, you can create an abstraction layer with many beautiful methods to send and interpret data from each pair. And once you've done this, congratulations, you've rewritten multi-pair connectivity. Still with me? Let's have a look at that. Oh. So let's look at that same app, but this time with our own custom implementation with our own framework. So the final iteration of my app is going to be called HeartChat. <laughs> yes, thank you. And it's going to look and behave much the same as the previous version, but this time we've got some of our objects and methods. Some of our objects and methods are going to be a bit different because we're calling the, the methods of the custom framework instead of multi peer connectivity. So I've got my. So these are a lot of the high level and low level stuff, and we're not going to poke around them there. It's where dragons are. Um, but, and this is a, essentially the main interface for it. Which we have some of our methods here. We've got a set of our connections. We've got, dictionary, we've got dictionaries of our peers that we want to connect to. Um, we've got our peer browser. And we've got all that there. And we can start connecting to peers, stop connecting to peers, stop everything, and other similar methods, such as sending data to one peer and sending data to all peers. So we're going to just hide that away for now. Again, all this will be available after I've had a chance to tidy it up a bit more. And in our peer manager.h, we are setting ourselves as, up as a delegate for JK peer connectivity. Even though we've got our own custom implementation going on behind the scenes, we've abstracted it out. So, we've, so it's a bit nicer to deal with. We've got a dictionary for our peers and to map them to values that we, the information we find out about them as well as their images. And we've got a few methods here for sending chat, for sending uh, images and messages, and updating information as we get it. In our .m file, we start up and call, where are we? We can start up and call our JKP connectivity method, class methods to start connecting to peers creating sessions, we can set delegate and start connecting to groups with ID. And this is essentially our equivalent of a service type, which I've just made one for now. It's been abstracted out to the point where all I need to do is call these methods. Uh, start can, when a peer joins is we can just say hello to the peer. Oh, hold on, sorry, I jumped back a step. I mean, all I need to do is start, call start connecting to peers. There we are, we'll start getting to peers. And that's how I've chosen to abstract it out. But again, depending on how much customizability you want, you can go poke around in a framework, in the framework, which is obviously not something you can do with Apple frameworks. The delegate informs me as peers come and go, so I can say hello to them and update my peer map as needed. And because this is a singleton class, I can use help, the, this helper method here um, to if for anywhere in my app, I can actually get it to return that array of my current connected peers. My protocols for sending data are all the same, which is down here. So I can say hello to my new peers, and I can send data. Here we are. So I've got a slightly different method for sending data, but the underlying abstraction that we've created is more or less the same. I've also created a message server, which I had in the previous one, but we didn't look at. 
is a message server that we get all the incoming data sent here, and then all we have to do when something comes in is decode it, and we've got a switch case for a hello. What do we? What are we pulling out for a hello? We've got a chat coming in, and we get their real name and their message and the message and for an image. So. On the top level, at the abstraction layer, it looks very similar. So, but let's have a look at the, if we see any difference now when we run it. So we're going to run hot chat. So this looks similar. And the other difference is now we've actually got a connection to ourselves because of how we've abstracted. So it's actually helpful to see ourselves in here. So I'm going to run this on iPad as well. And let's see how quickly, OK, so it's launched. And already we've resolved that connection and gone up here ID, the, the avatar image. So that was pretty, pretty quick. If we go to, over to the chat, well, this was pretty fast last time, so we don't need to worry too much about that. Text comes through almost immediately. But let's have a look at the difference when we try to send a photo. Yeah, let's send that one. And there it is. Let's try that again, just, just to try it out. And let's go with a Pavlova. And there we go. So we've seen that go from 10 seconds to send an image and to almost to less than a second. So that's pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to try one more thing. The demo gods are pleased with me today, which they might not be actually. There we go. So we've had a new device join us in this session. And that's obviously this one there. So that's pretty cool. So that's the end of that demo. And we're, let's go back to that. So what about our green bubble friends? What do we just see in that demo? One of the benefits of rolling our own framework and relying on Bonjour directly is that the ZeroConf exists on multiple other platforms. This means that it is quite simple <laughs> to create applications that talk between different platforms. Without going into too much detail or too much Java, Android added an API level 16, the NSD manager. To discover services, very similar to iOS, we discover services with our service type, pass it a listener, and then you get notified when a service is found, that, and that is far too small. So I'm going to zoom in a bit here. There we go. Um, but we're not going to go too much into Java. And some things you want to keep in mind when coding, oh, and similarly, we initialize that. And there we are. So that's how we can register a service as well. Something to keep, keep in mind when coding for cross-platform technologies is not everything you are used to may be available on the other platform. For example, in, on Android, we still don't have access to a TXT record and NSD, NSD manager. And a simple workaround for this is to, is, would be the Hello, on the Hello protocol. So I can actually detect that the information in the incoming TXT record is nil. So I'm going, OK, this is probably an Android device. Watch out for little Indian versus big Indian. Decide on what network byte order and stick with it across all platforms or you're going to have a bad time. Not all Android devices are made the same. And in fact, not all the same model are the same, funnily enough. In addition to this, it is important to consider the data structure that you're sending across the wire. In our examples, we used NS dictionaries converted to NS data. But when we're talking with Android device, we ensure that we send this as JSON as JSON serialized data, as this can be easily unpacked and interpreted, making it more efficient and cross-compatible. 
By doing, by doing all this, we can all help live in a better world where all our devices can talk to each other and our green bubble friends can become our best friends. I'm just going to play that again because I think you only caught the last end of it. Uh, you can't really do anvil animations in Prezi, but that was my attempt at that. Thank you. <laughs> my early anvil animation in my two talks. So a few weeks ago, I was writing my, uh, writing my presentations, I was procrastinating a bit, and I decided to take a little sidetrack. I decided I wanted to be able to control my presentation from my Pebble watch. This was, of course, about a week before the announcement of the Apple Watch. And it isn't hugely complicated to do, but a little convoluted and involved writing both a companion iOS app and a Mac app, because people can't talk directly to the watch. I attempted to control this presentation with my watch, and it kind of works, except right now there's some sort of bug, which I haven't figured out, where it's advancing two at a time. But it mostly works. And I was doing this using the, so the, uh, the iOS and Mac apps were built using JKP connectivity, my custom framework, but you could easily do it on multi-P connectivity as well as these talk between iOS and Mac now. So that just goes to show what cool things you can do when you have the ability to make nearby devices talk to each other. Though I'm sure with the Apple Watch, you'll probably get a nicer, easier way to handle that. So networking is not easy. But it is at the heart of so much of what we do, what we want and expect apps to do. Making things talk lets you create an engaging experience for your users. Over the last hour or so, we've looked at different ways of getting nearby devices to talk to each other with both multi-peer connectivity and with a custom networking framework. Multi-peer connectivity is, great, is a great framework provided by Apple and helps to help you get an abstracted app a networked app off the ground by doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you and abstracting away the complexity. I know very, I knew very little about networking code a year ago at DevWorld, and having that abstraction layer gave me the push I needed to give it a go and write this app that I had an idea for for a while. If you're a bit more experienced and want to get your hands dirty, the underlying code we looked at in a custom framework can give you more control of the interaction you want. There are some hard limits of what multi-P connectivity won't let you do, such as if you want more than eight people, if you want to talk cross-platform, then unfortunately you do have to go and learn a bit more networking code. Um, so that is me, and I think I'm actually, I'm actually on time, which is amazing. I'll have all the demo code available. I'll tweet it, or you can email me, and, I, and you can go have a poke through that. Um, come talk to me, or tweet me, or email me. And if you want to know more about Android, don't talk to me. Talk to Chris. Um, he can probably help you more. And thank you for coming. And enjoy what we have left of the conference this afternoon. Thank you.